welcome you all again in our panel discussion too that is the parent strategies manage ip to drive innovation and pad the bottom line so in this panel discussion we have mr gregory c mayor he's a counsel in scale llp Mr. Mr. Scott Keys, WW Patent Engineering Lead, IBM Intellectual Property Licensing. Mr. James Collinson, Senior Counsel, Intellectual Property, Asia Pacific Mastercard. Ms. Gloria, Director from uh, Biosers SA. Mr. Virain Soni, Director Patent Counsel from CME Group. Mr. John, Managing Member, Maldivian Law Group, LLC. Mr. Naven Jacob, Partner, United Trademark and Patent Services. So a very warm welcome you all and thank you so much for joining in the session and for being a wonderful part of the session as well so now i would like to uh, start the session all right great um great to see everyone and and thank you for uh, having me back uh to the conference gorilla organization i appreciate it um, I'll just do a brief introduction and then we'll just go around our panel and everybody can give a, you know 30 second intro I am a patent attorney with an aerospace engineering background. I worked at a law firm in Chicago for about 14 years and then went in-house working at a medical device company for about 12 and a half years. And now I just joined a law firm called Scale LLP, which is kind of interesting because it's all virtual. They don't have any office space. That's my brief intro. And then um, Scott, you want to go next, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm the worldwide patent engineering lead at IBM. I uh, have about 30 plus years of software engineering and development experience. And about 10 years ago, I transitioned into the patent world uh, here at IBM and using my background in software engineering to, to help with uh, patent monetization here at IBM. Uh, James, you want to go next or you're frozen? It looks like James. Yeah, sure. Be. I am. Um... Oh, there you go. I'm IP counsel for MasterCard for in the Asia Pacific region. I um, have a computer science background, and I originally was working in uh, in Angeles, um, but I've moved out to Asia, and I've been here ever since 2003, uh, working both in house and for law firms in a variety of different roles. Hi everyone, my name is Nevin Jacob Koshi. I'm a partner and head of the department at United Trademark and Patent Services, um, based in Dubai. With over a decade of IP experience in uh, various fields, including as a researcher, IP consultant, and technology transfer officer. I have a wide range of experience with various industry sectors, including startups and uh, universities. Currently, my focus is in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, actively helping clients to foster innovation in the region. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Viren Sony. Um, I'm an in-house patent attorney at a company called CME Group, Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group. Um, so we are a futures and options exchange, exchange, so in the financial services industry, and we provide a platform called an exchange for all the banks, um, high frequency traders, um, hedge funds, anyone who wants to trade futures and options. And we, we really provide that platform. So even though we're in the financial services industry, um, I would say, you know, more than a third of our company is, is, is really engineers, uh, providing the technologies to provide, you know, the trading applications, the infrastructure, security, uh, global connectivity, um, all the things that you need for a, a very high speed, low latency trading life cycle. And when I'm talking high speed and low latency, the, you know, people are counting microseconds and how can I improve my efficiency so that uh, I can knock out uh, five microseconds from this round trip uh, 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 message transaction. So uh, that's that's what the company does. And I manage the patent portfolio, uh, patent strategies, um, you know, provide IP training, motivate the internal workforce on, on submitting uh, disclosures to the IP team. Uh, before that, I was a, uh, at a law firm for five and a half years. So I've been with CME Group for five and a half years and uh, was at a law firm uh, for, for just about the same time. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering uh, and uh, minor in computer science. And so uh, I'm based in Chicago and have been practicing here for uh, the last 10 years. Okay, thank you, Sonny. My name is Gloria Montaron. I am the legal director and chief intellectual officer at Biosets SA. Biosets SA is a biotech company.
focuses on seed treatment the, with headquarters in Argentina. And we have more than 22 subsidiaries, mainly in Latin America. And one of our subsidiaries is listed at the New York Exchange at the NIC. So my expertise is IP and corporate and M&A topics. So thank you for inviting me and to join this, this panel. Hi everyone, John Malgin from Malgin Law Group. Uh, my background's electrical engineering. I've been a patent attorney for uh, over 25 years now. I worked in mostly private practice, but I also um, uh, had a couple of years at Tyco Telecommunications when we were laying fiber optic across the world. So that was an exciting time. I got to see what it was like in-house. Um, currently I run and manage uh, Malgin Law Group and uh, we are effectively uh, virtual um, as, as uh, as Greg was mentioning. Um, so it's pretty exciting to work with a bunch of great groups of uh, patent attorneys throughout the United States. Um, my practice is mostly um, prep and prosecution, uh, counseling, licensing, and um, uh, uh, IP management and strategy. Uh, we don't really get into litigation that much at my firm at this point. But thank you for having me on today and I look forward to having a good discussion today. So, so Viren, I think you're. I, I think if you want to get us started, with kind of just uh, laying the ground, and you know, kind of talking this topic to us, you know, about just kind of like generally seeding innovation at a company. How, what's kind of like the first thing we got to do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about the in-house perspective, and that's actually why I wanted to go. Um, that that's part of the reason I wanted to m move in-house. I really wanted to see how it works on the other side, and so. We have a couple of different things that we do to, to kind of um, lay the groundwork. You know, so we're, like I said, we're a financial services company. So patents are not uh, the first thing that our inventors are thinking about. You know, they're, they're, they're focusing on solving technical problems, solving business problems. And so what's been successful for us is really creating that culture, which takes many, many years. And so I joined um, after, luck, you know, luckily that culture was already there, but I saw that, that it was already there. Um, you know, buy-in from senior management, full support from, uh, you know, all the way down from the CEO for the patent program. And so once you have that, it becomes easy because now you can you can do all these initiatives that that create visibility for that program within the company. So, um, you know, and it's, it's very common uh, at, at most companies of our size, you know, sophisticated companies to have a, a, a pretty strong um, patent program. And so, uh, for example, you know, we have an annual luncheon where we honor all the uh, all the people involved in the patent program from the previous year if they filed the patent application or they were on a, on a granted patent um, so that's that's something that they really look forward to every year and um, we do that we have incentives we have bonus um, associated with you know certain um, activities you know filing a patent application uh, patent grants and then we also have milestone awards so if you hit a certain number you get an a, a, a additional cash bonus. Um, but I think what really motivates everyone is is just uh, they want to be involved in doing um, in, in creating new products and new services. And so we really try to tie our patents and, and the IP program to all the new innovations, um, all the new incentive, or sorry, the new initiatives that that are part of the company. So I think um, that's that's really uh, to me, the groundwork. So, so getting involved, um, talking to the different business units about what they're doing, you know, ahead of time, and trying to build that into their thought process, so that when they're saying, "Hey, this project, we want to release it in two years," sometime in that in that planning and sketching phase, somebody who has, uh, you know, is a stakeholder in that that project will will say, "Hey, let's run this past the IP team," and to create that that trigger. It, it, like I said, it takes a while, and it, it, but once you have that, it, it kind of becomes an automatic thought process for everyone. Hey, thanks, Aaron. I wanted to just kind of supplement this and your in-house perspective with mine. Um, I feel like when you talk to patent attorneys, they'll throw around this expression. They'll say, like, oh, you need to create this IP culture, right, like this culture of respecting and, yeah. and valuing IP rights. But then you're kind of like, well, what does that really 
mean? What does that look like? Um, MasterCard, when you join as a brand new employee, one of the first things you'll see is the video message recorded from our CEO. And it basically is him telling you that patents are the lifeblood of the company. And you know, when you, that's like one of the first messages you hear, like, that's really important. That's really powerful to set the tone of how valuable patents are and how valuable IP rights are to the company. And, and in MasterCard, that's the beginning and that level of engagement uh, exists at all levels of the business. And I feel that is really what is important is that kind of engagement. Um, the second thing I would, I, I would mention that's important towards kind of driving innovation um, at a company is, you know, not, I think a lot of big companies have these IP management uh, systems now. Not, you know, not all do. And I feel like this is so important to give uh, the employees, the inventors, a uh, control. You know, that they'll have their own dashboard, they can have their own invention disclosures, their patent filings, they can see everything, their rewards. Um, so I feel like this kind of system like really does a lot to just kind of keep uh, inventors engaged and allow them to kind of participate in ownership in, um, in their innovation and contributions to the company. So that's all, that's what I wanted to add. Right. I'm not sure if Gregory's still on moderating, but um, that might be a good segue for, for me to go and then Nevin can go after. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So yes. Uh, I believe he has some. He, okay. So, uh, Veard and James, that was a great setup for uh, what I'm going to talk about, which is the basics, getting back to the basics. Um, implementing what, what Veard and James just said. Um, is a process, you know, to have the culture, to have your C-suite uh, backing you, it's, it's, it's great and it's motivational. Um, and so really the next thing to do is, is if we have the folks, the engineers who are not necessarily thinking every day, I, I need to invent, they're thinking every day, I need to create technology. Um, what, what, what I do and what I suggest to companies and startups is to um, think about what they just said and, and measure you know, measure what you have. So the first thing to do, in, in my opinion, is to is identify what inventions, ideas, concepts you have in your company. Um, and um, I don't know if we have the slides up, but I'll, I'll read from what my slides uh, are. And the first thing to do is identify the IP. And when you're talking patent protection, uh, the very first thing you do is identify the uh, inventions, disclosures, uh, et cetera. And, and they all start out as trade secrets. Uh, so, um, you know, a trade secret is, is basically any information that's, that has value because it's kept confidential. You have to protect that, that, uh, that information. You have to prevent others from trying to get to that information. So if you have trade secrets, that's the start of the heart of the value uh, as we're talking about, you know, padding the bottom line. That's a great way to pad the bottom line is to, is to measure what inventions you have already. Then the next step that I suggest to, to folks that I counsel is to consider whether or not those trade secrets uh, should be uh, uh, patent applications. Um, and, uh, and so the process for patent applications is to have a harvesting session. Um, and the harvesting session should usually begin with what we call an invention disclosure form to be completed by one or more of the inventors. Um, and, and, and then, or, or concurrently, while you're having a harvesting session with inventors, um, you know, every, everyone should be involved, um, putting down on paper what they think is innovative and, and important and valuable to the company. Um, and then taking that IDF, that invention disclosure form, having a patent committee meeting, which would consist of, of, of multiples of disciplines, business folks, technical folks, managers, patent attorneys, outside counsel, and, and, and all of those folks should sit around and look at those invention disclosures to see if they're valuable to the company, if it's worth patenting versus keeping a trade secret, et cetera. Once you've done that, once you've identified and harvested these inventions, the next step is to try to protect them, right? So um, you procure the IP. Um, how do you procure the IP? Well, in the United States, you file in the Patent and Trademark Office, and in most other countries, you do the same. Uh, you prepare and draft an application with outside counsel. Um, and, and take it from there and, and prosecute it. And hopefully um, you'll get one or more of those patents allowed at some point, three to four years later, and then it's a matter of managing it. 
Um, and how do you, you know, how do you consider managing the IP? Um, again, this is all in interest of, of driving innovation and padding the bottom line, which is the topic of our discussion here. You want to do something with all that work that you put into and all the money that was put aside for getting these patents. So managing the IP is, is I think, a crucial step to getting uh, the, the, the group of C-suite uh, um, leaders as well as the, the whole company and community at large behind this. Um, and, and you know that could be done internally and externally. It should be done in a hybrid. And what James mentioned, having a program to do that is wonderful. So then everyone has access and transparency to what's going on at any moment. It really motivates people to want to be part of the team for getting these patents allowed and managing them. So um, as far as managing, where, where would you manage your firm, uh, the patents? Um, mostly um, in the United States, you, you want, if we're in the United States, we're, we're managing here, but then you want to look to core regions or countries outside the United States where your, your, your products or services may be valued uh, and where there may be uh, infringers. And, and last but not least, where you can actually do something about it. Um, because if you can you know, get a patent somewhere in a country, but then you can't assert it against anyone because the courts are not set up to respect the rights of the patent, so maybe you might want to think twice about that. But certainly you want to look to where you're manufacturing if you're, out, if you're outside the country. Uh, you want to get patents in those areas. So that's, generally speaking, how do you manage your RP, IP portfolio? You're constantly looking at it on a quarterly or semi-annual basis as to what's valuable and core to the business. You're looking at it geographically. You're looking at it techno technologically and, and making cuts and changes throughout the, the quarters and throughout the years. I think that's most important to keep it current. Um, many times I, I bring on a portfolio from a client, and the first thing we do is we look to see what we can cut. And, and what we need and what, what's core. Um, and then last but not least, um, another way to you know, pad the bottom line or manage your IP to drive innovation is to, is to prepare for an assertion or licensing or sale of that intellectual property. So many companies, operating companies, not non-practicing entities, but operating companies have now taken it upon themselves to consider the IP portfolio as, as, a, as a very important asset that they actively consider licensing, uh, selling portfolio portions as, as part of their bottom line. And so um, it, it's, it's really exciting to be working in these, in these areas of the law these days because it's, patents have become so sophisticated in their, uh, in their consideration of, of being an asset versus years ago, you know, you just, you, you get patents because that's what you did as a technology company. Now there's sophistication behind that uh, process. Thank you. So oh, I think we're, um, we're up to talking about specifically protecting IP in the age of COVID. And I think Gloria, you had some things you wanted to, to talk about um, specific to um, secondary medical uses. And I'm probably phrasing that wrong, but you can hopefully explain it. <laughs> yes, thank you, Greg. I, I want to share with you some IP tools that we have facing here in Argentina. Perhaps in other, in other countries are, are used to, 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 to provide, provide these services, IP services online. Here in Argentina was not, we are not used to. So this was one of one positive impact here in Argentina in our new normalcy that is the patent and the trademark office has been forced to improve to provide online services so nowadays we can file patent application trademark application and submit some kind of opposition or cancellations electronically that that, that was something before COVID something that was good in could happen here, so it was very important. It's a, a positive impact that we can face on COVID-19. And the other, another topic that I want to, to share with you due to our expertise at this biotech, patentability of biotech and pharma, and pharma protection, patent protections, one of the the, 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 the new topic that are raising now is second medical use 
as all, as all everyone everyone knows that there is a fight against time to, to find the vaccine and the treatment to to, to find the treatment to COVID-19. And on the other side, all the research and development on COVID vaccine are related to a, a new use of one active ingredient already known, for, uh, as example, for the already known for the treatment of Ebola, Ebola virus. So that means that we are in the, on the ground of second medical use, that is one specific active ingredient already known for one specific therapy that you can find another use to an, a different therapy. In some countries like Argentina and in another country too, there are some political restrictions in order to protect this kind of pattern, pattern claim. So I think that new uh, related to this COVID-19 vaccine, we will have to revisit and reconsider these restrictions. And if there is, on the other hand, there is some kind of concerns on the distribution of the availability of these vaccines protected by a patent, there is, in, in, in our patent framework, there is another tool that is a, a license compulsory that, are, that provides treats agreement and DOHA that we have to to, to, to reconsider and to revisit this kind of patents and compulsory licensing, but the gain here is to, to, to allow the protection of second medical uses in the countries that are not patentable subject matter. That is, is a very important issue to raise in every single IP protections regarding biotech and pharma, pharma technologies. But thank you, Greg. Thanks, Gloria. Um, so Scott, we'll switch gears a little from medical to um, software, electronics, all the things IBM is famous for. Um, can you tell us a little bit about IBM's monetization strategy for its vast portfolio and also how the COVID pandemic has affected those efforts? Please. Yes, yep, definitely. Um, so, you know, like you said, IBM has a vast portfolio. We have, you know, I don't, the count changes uh, constantly, but at least 60,000 worldwide patents um, that we try to main, you know, try to maintain that amount of num uh, that number of patents at any one time. Um, and, you know, our U.S. filings, uh, at least for, I think, maybe 27 years, last 27 years, we've been the number one patent grantee um, uh, in the U.S. <clears throat> so a very large portfolio. Uh, you know, when I j first joined this team about 10 years ago from the software development side of things, um, I really thought, you know, and I'm an inventor too at IBM. Um, you know, when I when I first joined the team, I thought um, the whole point of us creating these patents was to to make it so our competitors uh, couldn't practice the invention, so they couldn't integrate these cool features that we have in our products and their products. And it turns out, for the most part, except for a few key technologies of IBM, uh, you know, IBM wants others to use their inventions. They just want them to license it. So. Uh, you know, so they can bring so they can bring money in to uh, fund the other other R and D. So IBM, you know, invests about six billion in R and D every year, and uh, some of that money, you know, to recoup some of those costs uh, is uh, uh, money from our patent monetization and other IP uh, joint development agreements uh, that we work with others with um, that we have sort of tech license and licenses and uh, source source code licensing. Uh, so, so there's uh, different ways that we can monetize our IP. Uh, so that that's sort of our model. So the, the model is we have all this I, we have all these patents and it's been working for us for the past you know 30 years and I guess for the past 20 years maybe 25 years uh, we've been monetizing it. In the last 10 years we've been changing our models of monetization around uh, from not only licensing but also um, selling patents, which we didn't do you know 20 years ago let's say but last 10 years we've been selling a lot of patents as well uh, so we're using a sort of hybrid approach of uh, selling and licensing uh, to monetize the portfolio um, so you know that's pretty much th the model so during COVID during the pandemic that's going on right now I'd say you know at first when it first hit the United States back in March when it first you know started in March maybe February uh, April June the first three months 
you know, we, we were engaged with a bunch of companies talking about licensing agreements and all of a sudden, you know, all the responses back from the companies were, oh, you know, we'd like to talk about this licensing uh, situation and concern, but, you know, we're dealing with COVID. So, you know, there probably was a lot of real things going on for people back then, but at the same time, you know, of course, people are going to use it as an excuse too, if they can, because they don't, you know, they want to delay licensing negotiations usually. Um, um, so I found that, you know, the first couple of months, now that people kind of, it kind of set in and it's kind of like, seems kind of normal now, actually, unfortunately, um, uh, actually things are doing, we're actually, I would say we're doing better than we were doing this year with licensing now, um, in this environment. Um, and I'm trying to figure out why. And I, I think, um, a lot of our deals, we have a lot of deals in progress, you know, maybe 40, 50 deals at one time with, uh, you know, talking with IP, talking about IP. And I think the fact that we're having virtual meetings um, now with our customers, instead of traveling, you know, we, I used to travel and I hope to travel again soon because I love traveling. We used to travel to India, you know, Tokyo, Seoul, all these places, and we'd have to plan, you know, everyone's schedule. And so, you know, we, we could only meet like every one, you know, uh, every month or every uh, 60 days. Um, so that, that kind of inter, inter, introduced some latency in our, in our licensing process for the negotiations because it takes a long time sometimes to negotiate a license. Uh, with the, the deals that were already in progress, our virtual meetings, we can have every, you know, a couple times a week until we, you know, or every week um, until we hammer out all the, all the concerns everyone has on both sides of the licensing table. Um, so deals that are already in progress, I think, are going faster and we're actually closing quicker. I mean, just, uh, you know, at the at the top level, I think we're closing quicker. Um, new deals, I think, maybe suffer a little bit because I think it's good to have that face to face interaction with the, the company to build trust and to kind of put a, a face to the name. Um, so I, I still think that's valuable. And uh, maybe our newer our newer deals aren't ramping up as quickly as the older ones because we don't have that face to face contact. Uh, so. So I don't know. I think that's how it's uh, been affecting us so far. It hasn't really. It's actually, as far as I know, you know, from the part of the organization I'm in, uh, we're doing just as good as we were doing last year. Great. I think we need to circle over to Nevin, uh, talk a little bit about the things you've been dealing with. Um, we um, we know that in, in your region, oil and gas is, is a big priority. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what's going on in your world, Nevin? Okay, uh, just want to share the slide. Are you guys uh, seeing the slides right now? Yes, I can see it. And I, I don't know how to yep. make it bigger, but I can see it. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, as I said in the beginning, uh, I'm based in Dubai, uh, mainly dealing with the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia. One of the reasons that I've put up this map is many times when I go to US and other jurisdiction, Middle East is somewhere in the region, somewhere on the map, so people get confused with the, the countries and also just to put things in perspective, I thought I'll just start off with the, the, the political map. Uh, we are talking about around 20 to 25 jurisdictions in and around uh, the region, but I'm not going to cover obviously the entire jurisdiction, but these are the emerging technologies that uh, we are seeing over the last five to six years. And traditionally, uh, as we all know, it was oil and gas. Uh, any industry that was surrounding with that was flourishing in these jurisdiction. Um, other than oil, oil and gas, uh, in the first picture, it's tourism, retail, construction. These were the, the major set of industries. But we have seen after 2007, 2008, when the recession happened, countries all around the, the region started shifting their focus and they started uh, looking more into renewable sources of energy. Um, we are seeing solar technology. Uh, the UAE's vision uh, is to produce 75% of its energy from clean sources. Uh, so this is actually a life site of solar uh, uh, site uh, based in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we are seeing a research and innovation in agriculture, uh, creating food security, to create food security. Um, mainly to do with plant breeding, hydroponics, organic farming. And this is, again, these are all live pictures. And who would imagine uh, uh, 
uh, such greenery in, uh, in the middle of a desert. We are seeing again uh, technologies related with water, as we all know. It's okay. Uh, uh, water related technology like reverse osmosis, uh, desalination. Uh, there's a water security strategy uh, for the year uh, 2036 and a lot of industries and technologies based on that. And there are actual live research that's going on in these areas. Cloud seeding is another technology that is being developed locally and trying to improve on a yearly basis uh, so as to have a strategy of rain throughout the year or as and when uh, they need uh, rain in these jurisdictions. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, as you must already know, the world's first AI university uh, is already uh, up and running in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so we have universities that's coming up with AI uh, technology. Uh, UAE has the world's uh, first minister for artificial intelligence uh, just to cater those areas and those technologies so uh, the country is well equipped to address uh, the, the issues. Uh, these are, again, I'm not going to go uh, line by line for all these technologies, but the reason that I'm trying to show these in the last two slides is other than oil and gas, there's a lot of technology that is being developed in these regions, and there's a lot of potential uh, that for cross-licensing, for patenting, for uh, uh, research activities in these regions. And when it comes to that, one of the main filing strategies that they use is it's either the national phase or the regional application. So we have the, like the GCC patent application, which is typically act like the European system, one application covering six member countries, uh, all the major ones like Saudi, UAE, Bahrain, Oman. Um, again, not going into the details, I just want to touch base on it. There is the African system, like the ADIPO uh, filing system, the OIPI filing system, and again, as we all know, the, the national phase application. But of the three, uh, the, the second and the third is the major ones that is being filed. Uh, there are, again, pros and cons for each of it. It, again, depends on what your industry is, what is your long-term goal in these jurisdiction, and accordingly, we advise the client which among these strat, uh, filing strategy that uh, they need to use. Um, I'm going to conclude with a couple of questions uh, because, again, this is a new jurisdiction that a lot of our clients are filing. Uh, a couple of things is you need to know the total cost of filing costs. That's the basic I understand. But many a times there is translation cost that is involved. There is a legalization cost that is involved for like outstanding documents, for clients from US or Europe, they might not be aware of the, the process of legalization of power of attorney because in your jurisdiction, it would be a simply signed document or something of that sort. But when it comes to Middle East, uh, these documents needs to be legalized. So that that is an added cost to it. Uh, you need to plan ahead because translations are compulsory in some of the countries. So without an Arabic translation, you will not be able to file uh, your application. Fridays and Saturdays are weekend holidays uh, in most part uh, of the Middle East. Uh, again, substantive examination is done by not not most not every application is done by the local patent office. Uh, for example, UAE has collaborated with the Korean patent office, uh, so uh, all the application that is filed in UAE is actually examined by the the Korean patent office. Um, Lastly, know your agent because the term patent or IP attorney is very loosely used at this side of the world. Uh, for the reason being, it's not a regulated system. Uh, so even if you do not have a technical background or anything of that sort, you can call yourself as a patent attorney or a patent agent as long as you're working for an IP firm. So make sure that you have uh, rather than the firm or make sure that the agent that you are dealing with have qualifications to deal with your applications. Well, um, I know this is short, but if there is anything further that you require to know more about it, I've in fact written an article, it's already published, so you can check out uh, this particular article that is already published. 
And if there is anything further uh, after the session, feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I mean, thanks, thanks, Gavin. Viren, did you get to speak already? I'm sorry, because when I went off the grid, I lost track of who uh, got to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We started okay. off talking about okay, um, great. You know, in-house perspective. Yep. Okay. Yeah. okay sorry. Um, and and I'll bring a little bit more in-house perspective from my experience working at a medical device company for twelve and a half years. Um, we got involved in a lot of European matters, uh, oppositions at the European Patent Office, and also litigation in various courts in Europe. And if if people aren't aware, there's some there's some unique things in Europe. Um, I, I found that the opposition proceeding was a very effective tool to create freedom to operate. And you know, for me as an in-house attorney, that was my first priority was making sure that my company's products would have appropriate freedom to operate. Um, and I think that's a big deal about driving innovation. If you can't sell your innovative products, even if you can patent them, what good is it if you can't sell them? Um, so I had some slides. I'm not sure if we're able to pull those up. I just had a couple slides with some statistics, but um, I can summarize the statistics, which is basically in the European Patent Office, I think roughly 3% of patents go through this opposition proceeding. Um, but of those, of those patents that are opposed, only about one third of them survive the opposition without either being revoked entirely or amended. And so I think it shows, you know, when there's a lot of money at stake, obviously people have more money to do prior art searches and other things to scrutinize the validity of patents. And so, you know, an examiner only spends whatever, maybe eight hours on each patent application or something. But when there's, when there's, you know, a dispute and there's money involved because that's what, drives a lot of these patent decisions, um, you know, people will find better prior art than the examiner might have been aware of, um, or maybe find defects in the description of the patent. But anyway, I just want to throw that out as one way to sort of pad the bottom line and, and create, um, you know, better revenue streams for your clients is to make sure they have freedom to operate when it's appropriate. Um, the other thing is, um, I, I found in my experience just surprising um, how how different the legal proceedings are in the various patent courts around Europe. And so one of the things that I I, I found out, but I should have found out earlier, is that at least in the United States, and most countries might have this as part of their, their Department of Commerce or their diplomatic corps, is it, in the U.S. there's something called the um, IP attache, and it's... it's um, in, in various regions around the world, there are people that work for the United States Department of Commerce and really are part of the patent office. And they help um, American companies um, understand the legal proceedings relating to patents and trademarks in the various regions all around the world. So that's, that's a, a great tool if you're in the US and you're trying to figure out what your rights might be with intellectual property in the various court systems around the world that the ip attache program is great um so i i think we're uh we have like five minutes or no yeah five minutes so if there are any questions if people want to put them into the into the chat um i don't know if uh yeah i'm looking at the session chat i'm not seeing any questions right now um but I guess if we have if we have a little extra time, one of the other questions I was going to ask to the panel is, how do you deal with uh, what, what people might call skeptics? I know at my old company there was um, a scientist that thought patents were a waste of time because everybody can just you know violate the patents and get away with it, and the lawyers will make it all okay. And so they didn't you know some people in the company didn't really think patents were valuable. But has anyone else had experiences in how do you deal with that? Yeah, we, we get that a lot. Um, you know, software engineers, they, they in, in their world, especially if they're dealing with, um, you know, open source software and things like that, they, they just think that, um, you know, they might not agree with the general, like, they might agree with the general idea, but then these specific patents. So what I try to do is really, let's talk big picture first. I mean, do you agree that, you know, that, that whatever, like, I mean, I don't, I don't say it like this. I don't like interrogate them, but I try to, I explained that you know the intangible portions of a of a company are the most valuable right i mean you could take a company and replace all the chairs and all the computers everything it's the people that are left 
So I try to kind of bring that perspective that certainly your know-how, whether or not patents are the right solution or trade secret something, but your know-how, your your brain is is the biggest asset. And and it, while it's not a perfect system, uh, patents are the closest thing that we have to try to to protect that. And so, you know, you, you, when, once you get on that page and then say, well, it's not a perfect system, and you you have to admit, yeah, in software, it's 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 hard, you know, things are changing every couple of years, a uh, 20 year patent term in software, probably, you know, it, it probably not very useful. Uh, you know, I'm sure if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you, you do not have to explain to anyone the value of patents, right? And so I think it depends on your industry. Um, and I think you just have to say, this is the world that, that we're living in. And, and you know, it, it's, you got, then, it, then you have to go through the reasons, you know, it's not just that, hey, we're going to be suing somebody, but it's, we're we're trying to spur innovation within the company, and and this um, you you may file for you know one or two patents while while you're here, um, but those patent applications will get you thinking more creatively and inventing new solutions, even for things that you may not eventually patent. So I think I think those are some of the approaches that I've taken, and then you eventually get them to agree with you, and then you know lo and behold they they become one of your uh, most uh, uh, proficient, uh, prolific inventors after a few years. So <laughs> that's great. Thanks. So we are open for Q and A session, and I would just like to request our audience kindly ask the respective questions in the chat box or ask us to share audio and video. And meanwhile, I would just like to request you all of our speakers. Can we have a big cheesy smile so that we can capture the moment? Thank you yeah. so much for joining us in the session. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate everyone's 